Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's program. My name is Michelle Massey. I am the Director of Public Programs at the Museum of Russian Art. It is such a pleasure to be with you today. As you can see, the museum galleries are right behind me. Um, we are open today. We are open seven days a week. Uh, so if you are local, if you are out and about, we'd love to have you in our galleries. But as you can see with programs like this, we are also happy to join with you virtually. Now today is going to be a, a very interesting and um, titillating conversation, I have a feeling, uh, between author Stephen Walker and uh, one of our wonderful colleagues, Nick Hayes. Uh, today's uh, session is going to be recorded. Uh, we're thrilled to be talking about Stephen Walker's book, Beyond, his most recent book. Um, and this book is available at the Tomorrow Shop as well as many other places, including directly on his website. So we'll be directing you on how to get this book and how to read it if you have not. And we're hoping that you really enjoy uh, this resource in this interview today. Um, so we're gonna be recording this. And uh, so you'll be able to share this with family and friends uh, after this is over. I'll be sending out the link to all of you and we post it on our website, along with all of the other virtual programs that we do here at the museum, including virtual tours of our exhibitions. So you have a way to engage with the museum in many different ways. Um, you will be able to ask questions today. You can simply use your chat uh, function, which is at the bottom of your screen. If you enter a question for us today, only our panelists are going to be able to see it. Uh, we will get to the questions likely toward the end of our session. We're going to go 75 minutes today, about an hour and 15 minutes. So we'll save most of the questions for the end, but we do invite you to be a part of the conversation. So with that, um, Keep in mind that membership and donations help keep these, uh, these virtual programs alive at the Museum of Russian Art and also help to support our exhibitions and other programming. Uh, we'll be excited to hopefully have live events coming up in the fall, provided that everything is safe. Um, so your support means a lot to us. We have been happy to be thriving and moving along for, you know, moving forward, even in this uh, really interesting and tough time for many. So with that, I think it's time to bring on um, our wonderful colleague who is going to be moderating and interviewing our author today. Now, Nick Hayes is uh, an expert uh, that is, it's so wonderful to be able to engage with him. We have done lots of programs with him. He is what we would call a Sovietologist. He is, he's an expert. He's a popular commentator regularly featured on NPR the daily public affairs program Midday on issues ranging from political turmoil in post-communist Europe to the war in Iraq. He has appeared on NewsHour with Jim Lehrer and Religion and Ethics Newsweekly and given radio commentaries for NPR's Morning Edition and All Things Considered and Public Radio International's Marketplace. Nick Hayes is currently hold, holds the university chair in critical thinking at St. John's University. We are just so honored to work with him. Um, and so with that, I would like to introduce you to and bring to our program, Nick Hayes. There you are, Nick. Well, thank you for the introduction, Michelle. It's always a pleasure to be at the Russian Museum. And this is a project that I'm particularly excited about. I've always been a, you know, a fan and tracked the career, the legacy, the influence, the iconic image of Yuri Gagarin in Russian society. To me, I was always struck by the fact that he seemed to represent a genuine hero of genuine popular enthusiasm across the country. So we are going to be exploring the legacy of Gagarin, but through the lens of an absolutely wonderful book, my, my now friend, I've just met him, uh, Stephen Walker's Beyond. And Stephen, um, excuse me a moment. Stephen Walker was born in, in London. He has a BA in history from Oxford. He has an MA in the history of science from Harvard. He's written more books than I can list in the limits of this program. I would probably end up using up too much of the time from the program. He's a prolific author 
And his most recent book preceding Beyond was Shockwave, Countdown to Hiroshima, and was on the New York Times bestseller list. He's received numerous awards, two Golden Rose Awards for in international uh, entertainment and broadcasting. He's received awards from the British Academy of Film and Television Arts. And finally, but not the le least, he has received an Emmy. Uh, with that introduction, might I suggest we move ahead with the program and invite Stephen to join us. Hi, um, thanks very much for that introduction. So I don't know if you can see me, I'm in London. So I'm about sort of God knows how many thousand miles away from Minneapolis, but uh, it's uh, five past five in the afternoon here. And uh, I'm really delighted to be taking part in this, um, in this discussion about my book Beyond. The, um, what's it? Well, I've got the, I was told I had the longest subtitle in the history of books, the <laughs> astonishing story of the first human to leave our planet and journey into space. I don't know how I came up with such a long subtitle, but that is the long subtitle of the book. But the, the headline is, is beyond. So anyway, it's very nice to, to, to be here. Thank you. Well, I've, what strikes me about beyond is number one, it's exhaustive re research. I believe, I forget, what is it? 40 pages of footnotes you have there and annotations at the end of the book. Oh my God, you're, I, would, I would not want to buy it now. <laughs> 40 pages, is it really? God, but you have, uh, but the book's a product of work in archives, archives in the United States, archives across Europe, and above all, perhaps the most vexing, archives in Russia itself, a topic I think we're going to pick up a little later in this program. But one thing I want to compliment you for in particular, it's eminently readable. You would humble a lot of English majors out there with the style of your prose. It's, uh, you, you turn many a phrase and it comes to life in a variety of unexpected ways. Well, it's, it's a thriller, really. I mean, the 40 pages of notes are there because everything that I say, as far as I say it, is verified. I mean, it happened. Um, as far as I can judge, it happened. And it's important, therefore, to have a basis in, in reality. Otherwise, you know, what is it? It's a history book. It's a, it's a piece of nonfiction. This actually happened. But, you know, like so often happens, the, the reality is much more extraordinary than any kind of fantasy. And in fact, so much so that I even put a disclaimer at the very beginning of the book where I actually say, look, this, this, this has got so many twists and turns and it's so kind of nail biting that you're going to think you're reading nonfiction. You're going to, sorry, fiction. You think you're going to be reading some kind of, a, and you're not. Um, you're reading something which is a really extraordinary, very dramatic moment. I mean, I would say one of the pivotal moments, not just in 20th century history, but in all human history. Uh, and it happened 60 years ago on April the 12th, 1961. And, um, and I think that, you know, the footnotes are there for those who want to, to kind of delve into all of that. But really, to be absolutely honest, what, what excited me was the kind of the, the twists and turns and the sheer incredible drama of the story, which I try to do justice to. And you do justice to it with an amazing skill and just in terms of the narrative, uh, adding a sense of time as if we're watching the time tip minutes and seconds tick off leading to the, uh, to the launching and so on and so forth. But one aspect of, that really struck me, Stephen, is your gift for bringing out the humanity of the characters involved, characters who otherwise might not get a mention in many books of this kind. And I keep asking myself, how do you explain the phenomenal success of Soviet science at this period of time? And the answer has to be a number of prominent or not uh, excellent so, uh, Soviet scientists that aren't necessarily known well in the West. And in your story, I think we begin, the real the character behind the scenes is Sergei Korolov. Could you tell our listeners a little and viewers, who was he, what was his impact? This is a book, I mean, answering the question in a somewhat roundabout way, Nick, but this is a book about incredible personalities. I mean, it really is. It's a book about really big personalities on both sides of the world, both superpowers, the United States on the one side, obviously, and the Soviet Union on the other. 
The fundamental difference is that in the United States, everything is pretty much out in the open. It's a democratic society. It's a, it's a free, democratic, open culture or ideology, if you want to use that word. In the Soviet Union, it's the exact opposite. It's a totalitarian regime. It is a place of secrets. And one of the biggest secrets at that time in the Soviet Union is the man whose name you just mentioned, Sergei Korolev. He is a really key part of my story. He is the architect, not just of the Soviet space program at the time, but also of the Soviet missile program at the time. He is the man who designed the biggest intercontinental ballistic missile in the world in the mid 1950s, bigger than anything the United States had at the time. This was a missile which was so powerful and so big that it could be flown from the United, from the USSR to New York and drop a bomb on New York, approximately the size of 200 Hiroshima bombs. And that was in 1956, 57. He's also the man who was behind Sputnik, the satellite that freaked out the West and particularly the United States when it first did its incredible journeys around the world in late 1957. He is the man behind the first animal, the first dog in orbit, Laika, also in 1957. And he's also the man behind Yuri Gagarin, the first human being in space in April 1961. But the really extraordinary thing about this guy is that no one knows who he is. He is completely secret. He is, his identity has been erased from the books, from all kind of public releases. The CIA, and this is in my book, are desperately trying to find out who this guy actually is. And they never succeed in his lifetime. He actually dies in a botched operation in 1966. It's a terrible story in itself, but they never find out. And in fact, when his name is finally released in 1966, the whole world doesn't get it. The New York Times puts a very small obituary on page 66 of its weekend edition. They don't realize that this is the guy who is everything at the time. Whenever he goes around the USSR, he is protected by KGB bodyguards in case the CIA do identify him and do try to kidnap or assassinate him. So you've got this kind of James Bond world. You've got this incredible secret brilliant rocket designer, space architect, missile designer in the USSR on the one side. And on the other side in America, you've got his rival, a guy called Werner von Braun, who most people will probably have heard of, who was the man who later went on to design the Saturn V, the incredible Saturn V rocket that took the Apollo astronauts to the moon in 1969. He was a, an ex-Nazi who came over to the United States after the war. He did a deal basically with what was then the equivalent of the CIA. And they brought him over to the USA to build missiles for the USA. And that's what he did. And this guy, this guy von Braun is the great rival. So you've got this duel between von Braun, who is this German, this Nazi made a professor by Hitler, designed the V2 missile that was actually dropping bombs on London and on Antwerp in the Second World War, who's also brilliant, difficult, powerful, charming. I mean, a very powerful figure and very well known. Walt Disney made, made programs with him, a Hollywood movie was made about his life. And then you've got this other guy, Korolev, in the shadows. And this fundamental duet between these two people one knows one and the other doesn't know the other. This is a central spine of the story that I tell. There's another aspect to um, on the Soviet side of the story of, and Korolev. How, how can you reconcile a man that actually was prosecuted during the great terror of Stalin's time, that did time in the gulag, not in any preferred uh, status at all, but in the hard caps of Siberia, that he's brought back to work on this top secret project. Can you maybe explain that a little to me, Stephen? It doesn't that quite seem to come together. Question. So just to explain to, to people who are watching, basically this man, Korolev, has a completely different experience from Von Braun, the guy we were talking about. Von Braun essentially, essentially 
employed or was aware of concentration camp labor to build his V2 missiles. I mean, it was horrific, the stuff that went on in Germany at the end of the war to build these extraordinarily uh, advanced missiles for their time. In the Soviet Union in 1938, this guy Korolyov, the rival, this guy Korolyov was also working in very, very, very sort of what we would call quite primitive kind of rocket technology for the 1930s. And he was arrested as part of Stalin's terror. Essentially what Stalin did was he arrested, I mean, hundreds of thousands of people were arrested, uh, millions died really. Um, many were just shot, uh, many were sent off to the Gulag, the Siberian labor camps. Um, he was accused of attempting to undermine Stalin and the Soviet regime as a Trotskyite. And he was arrested in the middle of the night. He was sitting in his little flat in Moscow with his wife, Ksenia, and they sat on a sofa side by side for seven hours while the secret police, the NKVD, the pre-runners of the KGB, searched the flat for seven hours. And the husband and wife sat holding hands. They had a three-year-old daughter at the time, who I've interviewed actually, is now in her eighties. And then they took Korolyov away with them. And he was taken to a cellar um, and he was incredibly lucky not to have been shot that night. Um, he was made to sign a confession that he had actually tried to betray Stalin and undermine the regime. He was, as you rightly say, sent to a labor camp, one of the most brutal labor camps in Siberia in an area called Kolyma, where he was made to dig for gold 100 feet underground in these poorly maintained mine shafts. It's one of the interesting things that his daughter told me is that now in her 80s, is that he never ever wore gold for the rest of his life. He never actually could bear the idea of wearing anything gold for the rest of his life because he'd been digging for it when he was so, you know, when he was, he was in this terrible place. But he did actually, eventually he was liberated. And you're absolutely right. There is a kind of a, a very strange double thing that goes on, which is very common in totalitarian regimes like this, which is that he's still able to work initially for Stalin and subsequently for Stalin's successor, Khrushchev, building these missiles, even though he'd received this treatment at the hand of Stalin. So you could ask, you know, is this some kind of moral compromise? How did he do it? Well, he did it because he was a realist. He was a pragmatist. The alternative was either obscurity at best or being executed at worst, possibly dying of starvation somewhere in the middle. So that's why he did it. He also fundamentally believed in space. What he wanted to do was go to space. He himself wanted to go to space. It was the great dream that nourished him all of his life. All of his life, the idea of investigating and exploring the planets, the moon, maybe one day the stars, was his animating motivation. It really was. And he always said in private, secretly, and I know this from lots of people I, I interviewed who knew him, that these missiles that he was building were powerful enough to take human beings into space. And one of the extraordinary things about the missile that we're talking about that did take Yuri Gagarin into space, is that essentially it is an intercontinental ballistic missile in which the thermonuclear warhead at the top, the thing that could destroy New York several times over, is replaced by a capsule with a human being inside it. And it's powerful enough to go into orbit. We actually have a photograph of it. Can I, I quite like to show people, if we look at picture Thank number you. one, um, we've got a photograph of the rocket that, which is also the missile, that Yuri Gagarin traveled on into space. This is, you're looking at it now, this is a picture from 1967 uh, in Belgrade. It was one of the first times it was actually made public. Before that, it was, it was absolutely top secret. Um, but you get a sense from that, don't you, of the sheer scale of that thing. And the sheer courage, frankly, involved, it's what you were saying, Nick, at the beginning of this conversation, the sheer courage involved in a human being of whatever ideological persuasion of a human being being the first human being to sit on top of one of these things, which is obviously vertical when it was on the, on the launch pad and being fired into space and the candle essentially being lit. I mean, this is the Russian 
right stuff. So that is, and that was the biggest missile in the world. And the man who built it, this guy Korolev, I can show you a, uh, a picture of him actually. If we look at number three, a lovely picture we have of him with Yuri Gagarin, you'll see um, that, that he has this, um, this very warm kind of paternal, I mean, unexpectedly so, he's the man on the right, and Yuri Gagarin with his famous smile is on the left. And what you'll see is something that his own son, this is Korolev's son, a daughter, forgive me, said to me about him, which is that he loved Gagarin as a father. And there is something in that expression which is incredibly moving. And yet what you're looking at is the man that the CIA were desperate to find out his identity, desperate to find out who that man was. Um, and it's quite interesting, we could actually have a look at his rival, if that's okay, Von Braun for a moment. If we look at number, number five, you'll see the duet I'm talking about. So on the other side of the, of the world, the man that was actually his, his great rival, Werner Von Braun, is shown here looking through a periscope. I think this was in the late 1960s. Um, suave, handsome, um, had become an Americanized citizen, at that point, American citizen, as I said, had a Walt Disney series made about him and his past as a Nazi officer in the SS and the fact that Hitler had made him a professor on the spot when Hitler saw one of these V2 rockets, that past was completely eradicated. I spoke to many people who worked with Von Braun in NASA who absolutely insisted on me that he wasn't a Nazi. In fact, he was a, a fully paid up member of not just the Nazi party, but of the SS as well. And if we look at picture number four, you'll see an earlier incarnation of Werner von Braun, this time not with Americans, but with the people that uh, he was essentially serving at the time. There he is, younger, still handsome, still suave, still brilliant, but with men of a very different cloth from the people he worked with in the United States many years later. So these are the two rivals, as I said, that partly animate and drive the narrative of my book Beyond Forward. Can I, I'm going to change the subject a little bit into a different type of character that comes out of your book. Yeah. Um, I think it was my first night reading the book. I um, <clears throat> was deeply drawn into the character of Ham. Ham. Um, yeah, I, well, um, yes, yeah, sorry. Stephen, I could tell you, I was, I was reading it as, uh, you know, perhaps not even consciously all the time thinking this is a chimpanzee. Yeah. You gave personality to it. You gave, you gave Pam ang anxieties, or at least projected them. Uh, I've, I don't think I've ever read, um, in, the, in fact, a literary account that gave the, uh, in this case, chimpanzee such life such uh, interest in characters and i'd like to think dignity actually yes. because you know because actually chimpanzees are very like us um let me explain a bit about ham and, and about the animals actually generally so the americans nobody knew what would happen if a human being went into space i mean we are used to the idea of weightlessness and all the rest of it nobody knew nobody knew anything in the 1950s they knew virtually nothing at the beginning. They thought that um, it was perfectly possible for a man's eyeballs or human beings' eyeballs, I should say, but we were talking about men because that was the reality at the time, of a, of a man's eyeballs to burst out of their sockets. They thought the heart would stop beating. They thought it was possible the circulation would stop, which is essentially the same thing. They thought that it would be impossible to swallow. They thought it might be very difficult for human beings to deal with these incredible acceleration forces from a rocket launch where you end up weighing many, many times your normal weight and you can barely move your arms and limbs. They thought weightlessness might kill. And they also thought human beings could go insane. I mean, they called it space horror. Mm -hmm. They genuinely thought it was possible for, for a human being in space, divorced from the world and everything that he or she had ever known could actually go insane. And we can talk a little bit about that later on because there were certain kind of provisos and things they did to try and stop that from happening. But in order to find out what these effects would be, they sent up animals. The Soviets sent up dogs and the Americans sent up monkeys and then chimpanzees. 
And the chimpanzee that you're talking about, Ham, was a critical flight that took place in January 1961, just two weeks after Kennedy's inauguration. And it was a very important flight indeed, because the purpose of this flight was to prove that a human being, an American astronaut, could do the same, essentially exactly the same flight. The chimpanzee's name was Ham, but not originally, actually. He, had, he was known as Subject 65, and he was only given the name Ham just before the flight, and he wasn't even given that name publicly in case he never came back alive. Um, there's a picture of Ham, actually, which we can have a look at, um, and I've got it in number 21. So Ham was kidnapped from his mother when he was a baby in West Africa by animal trappers, and he was sold to basically to NASA for $450 to join another bunch of chimpanzees who were all being trained for space missions. Uh, a lot of these chimpanzees had already been involved in acceleration tests on the grounds and many of them had actually died in the process. Ham was, was actually chosen because his temperament was considered to be quite docile. Um, and also because he did very well in his training on something called a psychomotor. And a psychomotor is a machine essentially that fits into that little cubicle you see him sitting in there. Uh, there was a, a lid placed on that cubicle and inside the lid were basically two handles and a series of flashing lights, white lights and blue lights. And the chimpanzee would have to basically react to those lights by pushing or pulling these handles in a specific sequence. And if he got it wrong, his feet were zapped by an electric shock. Actually, the point where this photograph is taken just before he was taken out uh, to the rocket in January 1961, his trainer, the guy on the left, a man called Edward Dittmer, uh, had already inserted an electrode uh, into his rectum, into a seven inch rectum, seven inches into his rectum, actually. Um, it's horrendous and, and various other electrodes and also had placed these pads, these um, electrocution pads essentially on the soles of Ham's feet. And Ham was then launched into space on January the 31st, 1961 for what was supposed to be a 15 or 16 minute flight. And as I describe in my book, and I've got right into the details of what really happened, because it was subsequently presented as essentially a success, but it wasn't a success. Um, and one of the key things that happened is that the fuel, because of a faulty valve, ran out half a second earlier than it was supposed to, as a result of which Ham's mission was essentially aborted. And that meant that his capsule separated from the rocket and shot way, way higher than it was supposed to go and landed far further downstream in the Atlantic Ocean than it was supposed to land, hundreds of miles from where the waiting rescue ships were. He went through the most terrific ride on the way down. And what made it worse was that it upset the system of the psychomotor so that even though he was pressing the right buttons, the right levers, his feet were still getting zapped by electric shocks. He landed in the Atlantic Ocean. There was a leak in the capsule and he started to sink. It, they began to take on water and it took on 800 pounds of water before a rescue vessel was able to pick him up. They got him on the deck of a ship. He was given an apple for his, uh, for his efforts. Um, there's a face of him, a famous shot of him where he was grinning which the chimpanzee sort of psychologist, um, one of the, Jane Goodall, one of the most famous world experts, people probably know who she is, describes as one of the most, the, 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 probably a picture, an expression of the greatest fear she's ever seen on any chimpanzee in her entire lifetime. I'm just gonna open this curtain slightly because I can see I'm getting a bit dark. I don't want to make it hard for people to see me. There we go. Mm -hmm. um, it's getting a bit darker here because we're, we're obviously several hours ahead. Um, that flight, changed everything because it made it actually very, very worrying for the idea of setting up a human being in his place. And it delayed NASA's decision to put a human being up just long enough for this guy Korolev to see a very small window of, of opportunity, take huge risks with a human life and fire Yuri Gagarin in the gap into space to win that 
element, that first leg, if you like, of the space race. So they used chimpanzees. Before that, they used monkeys. Um, the Russians, as I said, used dogs. And they sent up about 40 dogs. In fact, we have a picture of one of them. Number 22 is a good example of, of, a, of a space dog that was used by the Soviets. Um, and most people remember the name Laika, who was the dog I mentioned earlier. There, there you see that's a, that's, a, that's a dog about to go into space on the Soviet side. So the Soviets fired about 42 of these dogs up on rockets. I mean, it's quite incredible. I didn't know that until I started to research it, but I interviewed the woman who's now passed away who was running this program. Uh, it's not the woman in the picture, but it would have been a contemporary of hers. Um, some 21 of those dogs died. Um, and one of them incredibly ran away just before launch and got away. And the only, they, were, they had a rocket about to go. And so they had to find another dog. And they found a stray that was wandering outside the canteen. Can you believe this? This is, this, I haven't made this up. It was wandering outside the canteen in the rocket missile complex. And they literally took this dog and put this dog in one of those spacesuits, put them in the rocket. And this poor hapless dog was then fired into space. So they used these dogs. And the key difference between the Americans and the Soviets on this is that because the Soviets kept everything so secret, whereas the Americans, for the most part, they weren't terribly honest, NASA, about what happened with the chimpanzee flight, but certainly the Soviets were really secret. Just to make sure that their technology was protected, they also put, this is incredible, they also put bombs on Soviet spacecraft, which were triggered to explode with the dog or dogs, because sometimes there were two, inside. If by any chance the spacecraft went off course and looked like it was going to be heading towards a capitalist country like the United States. And there was incredibly a discussion that took place a week before Yuri Gagarin flew where a very senior figure in the KGB okay. argued for putting the same bomb on the human flight as well, in case Yuri Gagarin decided to defect, in case he decided not to go back to Russia, but to head towards Alaska or somewhere else instead. And he was overruled. It was an incredible secret meeting, which I've got into, and I've found a diarist who was, who's a very key element of my story, that they actually, actually seriously considered doing this. And it was just a week before, I can you imagine if on Neil Armstrong's Apollo 11, they had secret, the CIA had secretly put a bomb in case the crew went crazy and they were gonna to head towards Moscow rather than to the moon or something like that. And they literally blew, they were gonna blow this up. That is the level of discussion and of secrecy and of paranoia that you're dealing with in this period. Con, when I realized the magnitude of the animal experimentation and the use of animals in all of these programs, it, a, a political observation that seemed fairly obvious came to me immediately. Has there been any backlash from animal rights groups and so on and so forth to this type of experimentation? Well, there was certainly an in our context. I mean, I know there is, of course, in other contexts. But I'm speaking specifically here. Well, there was certainly a backlash when Laika was sent uh, up into space. Uh, I mentioned it in my in my in my um, in my book. Um, you know, there were there were dog lover and animal rights groups all over essentially the Western world. Mm -hmm. um, when she went up into space, she was basically she went up, and they had no way of getting her down. They, the technology didn't exist. This is in 1957 just after Sputnik. It was another way of dazzling the world and proving to the, the, the USA that the USSR was top nation and, and, and could do these incredible things that the United States couldn't. Because at the time, incredibly and paradoxically, the US was behind technologically in, some, in, spe, in the space world. It was very definitely behind at that period. And, and so they could get this dog up, but they couldn't bring the dog back. And that, I mean, if you read the newspaper headlines at the time, that is a real, that was a real black mark. I mean, it was an incredible mm -hmm. achievement, but it was a real black mark. On the American side, very little. There's a, there's a press release, which I found in the Fort Worth NARA archives, 
which is NASA's press release, uh, which was released to the press the day before Ham's flight on January the 31st, 1961, which basically says um, that, uh, you know, all kind of animal concerns have been um, observed. Um, you know, we've done everything to make uh, the animal comfortable and, and, and to, to do everything we should do, if you like, uh, for the safety and comfort of this animal in the course of this flight. But to be honest, to design a machine which can electrocute uh, a chimpanzee's feet um, in the course of what would have been anyway, a pretty, I mean, it's the same flight that Alan Shepard did, um, mm. you know, for which he got a medal from Kennedy, literally three months later. And here's a chimpanzee going up, but you know, Shepard did not have electro plates attached to his feet uh, that he'd get zapped if, if for whatever reason he made some kind of mistake operating a lever or two. So. I, I think that I think there was some concern on the American side in animal rights groups, but not really, not in the way. But I, I do think that in my book, I mean, it is a section of my book. This I, I think I think that there is no way, a bit like medicine. There is the debate is there's no way that they would have got a human being into space if they hadn't done these experiments. That's the awful, brutal, sad, desperate truth. The animals were there for a reason, but that is not to negate, in my opinion, the appalling suffering that many of these animals experience. I found that a very moving part of the book for me to write. Um, and I've had it's a lot obvious of, in the writing. Yeah, a lot, a lot of reviewers and people have come back on that. It's, uh, it's. Um, I remember one character, a bit like you, one, one, one uh, interviewer in London for the London Times said to me, oh, Ham is my favorite character in the whole book. <laughs> So I thought, well, that's something anyway. So, you know. Well, I, I hesitated to admit that because it could be seen as kind of an insult. Uh, it's meant as a compliment. A beautifully written, interesting character. Thank you. It, it worked for me. I have one last character on my list of favorites yeah, sure. that aren't probably on your normal list. That is, of course, Ivan Ivanovich. Well, and I don't stupidly have a photograph of him, which is a real shame. Oh, Ivan awesome. Ivanovich uh, is a wonderful character because he's not real. He's a <laughs> He's a mannequin. I don't know what you call it in America. We call it both here, but maybe it's the same right. thing. Um, so essentially what happened was, was that, do you remember I was talking a few minutes ago about the gap that Korolyov goes in? In other words, that there is this moment where Korolyov, this guy, sees the Americans, NASA specifically, stumbling. They're stumbling after this flight of hand that hasn't gone quite right. They haven't really admitted that it's gone quite, hasn't gone quite right, but it hasn't gone quite right. So they're stumbling. They are hesitating. Should we send a man up? Should we not? Should we, should we not? Should we, should we not? And NASA is totally divided on this. It gets completely kind of divided between those who say we should go, including Alan Shepard himself. He said, I'm willing to die for my country. The Russians are very close. We must go now. And oddly enough, Werner von Braun, the cautious German, who was saying, my rocket is not ready to take a human being. We have to have another test flight without an animal this time, just on its own, like a robot flight, and just to see if this thing works before we commit a human being. Kennedy himself had made a speech in February 1961 at a press conference. Remember, he's new in the job, Kennedy. He's two or three weeks into the job at this point. And he also says, we must not risk losing a human being in front of the world because all this stuff is going to get televised. 80 million American viewers could end up watching a human being, an American, blow up on live TV. And before I just answer your point about Ivan Ivanovich, can I just can I just quickly can I just quickly get a picture here, number 18, mm -hmm. and then I'll come back to Ivan because it's it's connected. Number 18 shows you the kind of danger that could, that, that was awaiting these astronauts. So that is a picture of a Juno rocket, um, another Von Braun uh, machine um, in 1959 that blew up at Cape Canaveral. I mean, it, it, it was really, I mean, it just went haywire, this rocket and actually turned back towards the bunker. There was a documentary film being made by the famous CBS reporter, Ed Morrow at the time. And he was actually filming this thing and it actually came right back towards the bunker. And in fact, I interviewed one of the guys in the bunker who actually remembers this moment. This is the danger 
that you're facing. This is not today. This is 1959, 1960, 19... These machines are dangerous. They blow up. Many of them blow up. Um, and it's a kind of a persistent problem all the time. So the Germans are counseling caution. Kennedy is counseling caution. Korolev says, this is our opportunity. This is our chance to show that the Soviet Union is the great nation, is the nation, is the future, technologically, politically, ideologically. We're right in the center of the Cold War. So they decide they're going to go ahead with two flights in quick succession, not with a human being on board, but with a mannequin, Ivan Ivanovich. And he looks exactly like a human being. He is dressed in a spacesuit. He is so lifelike that he freaks out all the people at the missile complex when he's actually delivered to the capsule, to the rocket. He is actually has a stomach inside of which are various kind of rodents. I think there's 40 black mice and 40 white mice inside. <laughs> God knows, all kinds of things are inside his body. They also, I think, gloriously put a tape recorder inside his stomach which broadcasts Russian patriotic songs from space, from the Piatnitsky choir, very famous choir, as you well know. And they broadcast these, these, these songs about the motherland as Ivan Ivanovich in his capsule goes around the earth, totally freaking out the CIA in their electronic intelligence stations. Like, how many men have they got up there? You know, they, 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 is he real? Is he not real? Insane. One of my absolute favorite sections of the book, by the way, but go on. <laughs> oh, I must say as well, for, I don't want to give everything away because I want people to read the book, but they also, and one wonders whether the Soviets did this as a joke, they also recorded a recipe for Russian cabbage. Yeah. <laughs> and that's also brought, so you get these guys in the Aleutian Islands, these CIA intelligence operatives, and they're hearing a Russian recipe for cabbage soup coming from somewhere in and they have no idea what the hell is happening. So, you know, there's all of this stuff which is which is gold dust. I mean, you can't make it up, but, but it happened. <laughs> Thank you. As I said, one of my favorite uh, sections <laughs> of the book. I'm going to try to maybe move the conversation into yeah. a bit more of a political realm and um, into real politics. Um, we're also talking about in this story, uh, about a political rivalry, the two rivals, Khrushchev and Kennedy in this case. Yeah. Now I would presume, given all of my cultural biases and background, I would have presumed that the tall, handsome, charismatic young president uh, and his charming wife would have easily been able to deal with the kind of short, stout, irascible Khrushchev uh, easily. But that is not the story that emerges in your narrative at all, if, I, if I'm reading correctly. No, no, no. That is, we, my, my book is it's a, clear, excuse me, you seem to have a gap in that. That's right. Can you, can you, can you, can you've got me now or not? Are you frozen actually there? I don't know, Nick, I, am I still on? I hope I am. Um, can you hear me? You're still on, Stephen, you're good. You're still on. Oh, okay, that's great, because Nick's actually frozen there for the moment. Um, I'll just answer the question and hopefully Nick will unfreeze <laughs> yourself as we go along. Um, the key thing about, um, the key thing about Kennedy is that he's new. He, has, he is an untested president. This is January, February, March, 1961. The guy has come into the presidency in mid-January. The inauguration is on January the 20th, 1961. He is not somebody at that time who is considered to be anything except young, glamorous, but inexperienced. Khrushchev is a wily, experienced, I mean, a real, I mean, he's a, he's a, he's like, blo he's a Blofeld character in some respects. He is a, he's a kind of a wonderful, somewhat darker, um, funny, um, outrageous kind of character who looks at Kennedy as a kind of kid, essentially, with very, very little experience. And Khrushchev is somebody who wants to bring the world to the Soviet Union. And he has a massive chip on his shoulder about the United States. I mean, he wants to prove again and again that the Soviet Union is better than the United States in every single way possible. They've got better technology, they've got better this, they've got better that, they're better at everything. 
But at the same time, he is awed by the United States. There's a wonderful, wonderful moment where he visits America on one of his tours in the late 1950s. And he ends up at the canteen, the IBM canteen. And he has no interest in the computers at all, but he's completely obsessed with the formica top tables that they have in the canteen of the IBM offices and says, this is the future, <laughs> not the computers. This is what we actually need back in the Soviet Union. So he has a chip on his shoulder about America. Um, and yet he wants to prove that the Soviet Union is bigger and better. So you've got these two kind of, you've got a young 43, I think year old, innocent, innocent is the wrong word, untested, inexperienced president who is on a fault line. As you well know, the Berlin Wall is just a few months away, its erection. You've mm -hmm. got Laos, which is a real problem in Southeast Asia. Vietnam is about to blow. And you've got Fidel Castro in Cuba, just 80 miles from the Florida coast. These are very, very dangerous times. And Khrushchev exploits it brilliantly because he realizes that having these, what he calls space spectaculars, Sputnik, the first dog in space, the first human in space, the first woman in space, the first two man ship in space, the first, all of these kind of first space spectaculars are guaranteed not just to freak out the West and particularly Kennedy, but also to bring those uncommitted nations in the world towards what they perceive as the future, which is not the USA as it turned out to be, but the USSR. So we're on a fault line. And in my story, it's a worm's eye story. I don't try and pretend, I mean, of course we know what happened, but my story is taking you in, what was it like to be there in 1961 when you didn't know? This is not the Kennedy that ends up with the Cuban Missile Crisis. This is not the Kennedy that says, let's go to the moon. This is not the Kennedy that is assassinated in 1963. This is a different, this is a, a Kennedy that is unsure of himself, uncertain, frightened about losing an astronaut on the pad in front of all those millions, is being pushed towards an invasion of Cuba at the Bear Pigs by the CIA, is, is, is not cowed, I wouldn't say anything as strongly as that, but is unnerved by the power and the, the sort of the real dangers that a Khrushchev led Soviet Union and Eastern Bloc represents to the Western free world. And this story mm -hmm. of putting a man in space is right at the center of that tale. And so at the heart of the story, Khrushchev has one of these uh, space spectaculars after another and another. And for the most part, JFK has a, a record of kind of embarrassment. Yeah, well, he does, because the space program, what people don't realize is the space program was a mess, fundamentally, in the United States. NASA was on its knees in 1961. There was a real feeling that it was going to end. I mean, the military really wanted to take control of space. So NASA was not the organization that it later became, particularly in the late 60s with Apollo. That's all later. This is a NASA that has no real confidence in where it's going. This is a NASA that's so cautious that they actually were talking about sending up 30 chimpanzees, not one, 30 chimpanzees, in order to make absolutely sure that they knew that a human being, when he finally went, would actually survive the mission. And there's a great irony in this story, which was that, that, that a man called Jerome Wiesner, who was basically Kennedy's science advisor and was very anti-human space flight, and as indeed was Kennedy, he was not interested in the idea of humans going to space. This was not his thing. He was pushed to it by what happened with Gagarin. But this guy, Wiesner, was commissioned to do a report on the space program, whether it was a good thing or a bad thing for human beings to go into space, an American. And he submitted his report saying that we need to do more tests and more checks and more this and more that. After three months of investigation, on April the 12th, 1961, that report landed in the White House on the same day that Yuri Gagarin flew around the world. I mean, that I mean, is an incredible irony. Um, should we, should we not send a human being in space? Gagarin had already done it that very day. You know, your book uh, related to this question, another question like it, it forced me to ask the question, why did the United States lag so? 
Why was it so difficult? When you consider all of the obstacles the Soviet Union faced, why was it such a difficult path for the United States to at least create some kind of equality in terms of the arms race? Well, it's kind of two things really. One is a technical thing, and one is a, it's a much bigger thing about the difference between the United States and, and the Soviet Union and an entire cultural thing. The technical thing is, is, is paradoxical, fascinating, and quickly dealt with. Essentially, the, 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 the Americans had much more sophisticated thermonuclear weapons, hydrogen bombs, on the, than, than, than the Soviets did. They'd been making them for longer. They basically invented, well, they invented them um, in Los Alamos. They, these, th their weapons were light and they were sophisticated. Um, and that meant that they required less heavy rockets to deliver them to their targets. So the very thing that made the Americans advanced in one respect, their bombs, meant that they did not have rockets or missiles, which are the same thing, essentially, which were big enough to put human beings into orbit early enough. The Soviets had great, big, heavy, relatively primitive hydrogen bombs. And these great, big, heavy, primitive hydrogen bombs needed great, big rockets like the one we saw to fire them up into space, uh, to fire them into, into their targets across the world, a quarter of the way around the globe. And for that very reason, they were able to send human beings into space. So there's a technical reason why the Soviets were ahead. But there's also much more than that. And it comes back to this question of an open society versus a closed society. The Soviets did all their launches in secret. If the launches went wrong, if it blew up in like we saw that rocket, nobody would necessarily know about it. I mean, they might, but it would be kept all secret. And many of the secrets were kept not just then, but kept for decades. I mean, there were secrets that I was revealing in my book that had only been revealed very, very recently, and that's 60 years later. I mean, that's how secret we're talking. Many, 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 many examples of that. And indeed, some examples to this day, like the bombs I was telling you on board, the, the spacecraft with the animals, the, to this day, when you cannot get evidence of exactly how those bombs worked on those spacecraft. That's still buried somewhere in the Kremlin archives. You, you, you can't find out how that worked. I, I couldn't get anybody to, to kind of give me evidence about how these things, and I really, really tried. So you've got a situation where in America, risk means political risk. If a man is to die on a launch pad, as Kennedy's, one of his chief scientific advisors, not the guy I was mentioning, but another one said, it would be the most expensive public funeral in history. That's what it would be. So in order to escape that horror of 80 million American viewers and the rest of the world, including the crowing Khrushchev, watching Alan Shepard blow himself to smithereens on top of a rocket in color, because color TV had just come in at that point, although not many people had it. Actually, you had to be really careful. The Soviets in a totalitarian secret regime could take risks. They were able to take risks in a way with men's lives, in a way that the Americans were not. And people died along the way. In my book, there's a story of a, I show you a picture, which is quite interesting. If we just go to, um, if we go to number 15, could we have a quick look at that? Um, there's a picture in number 15 of something called the isolation chamber. And this was something, or otherwise known as the chamber of silence. Look at that thing. So that is a horrific thing. It's a pressure chamber. It looks like an electric, you know, gas chamber for an execution chamber. And that is where every one of the cosmonauts, there were 20 of them in secret, went for an indefinite period of time to be completely cut off from all human contact, up to two weeks actually, but they weren't told how long it was. As I said, it was indefinite. And they lived in this little room, uh, sealed off in a pressurized chamber without being able to talk to anybody to see if they could survive isolation without going insane because of the thing I talked about earlier about space horror. Um, two weeks before Yuri Gagarin's flight, three weeks actually before Yuri Gagarin's flight, the youngest of the cosmonaut group, a man called Valentin Bondarenko went in there and on the 10th day, 
he was taking off his electrodes um, and he had a bit of alcohol soaked cotton that he had to use to, uh, to get them off, soaked his skin. And he tossed the little ball of cotton behind his shoulder and it landed on an electric hot plate. And the whole thing in this oxygenated atmosphere inside that pressure chamber suddenly was on fire. And they couldn't open the doors. You see those double doors you've got there, like a submarine doors. I mean, it looks like an execution chamber, doesn't it? They couldn't open the doors until they'd actually equalized the pressure. And they could only watch through the portholes if they watched anything at all. As Bondarenko desperately tried to put out the flames um, and was essentially burned to death. I mean, he didn't die there and he died in agony several hours later. This is three weeks before Yuri Gagarin flew in space and they were very close friends. He was a very popular man, Bondarenko, very popular man. That was kept secret, completely secret uh, for 40 years, well, 30 years, certainly, totally kept secret. And yet it happened, but they kept going. They didn't stop like they did in the famous Apollo 1 fire with NASA. Um, when three astronauts died on the launch pad in a test, terrible test, um, at the very beginning of the Apollo program in the mid 1960s, and everything stopped while they got their act together and started to think about what they did. They kept going. Can you imagine being Yuri Gagarin and being told that this guy had just burned to death, but you know, you and died in obscurity, but you know that you absolutely have to go ahead and do this flight. They, they felt differently about risk. To, uh, forgive me if somebody's keeping. Two, they literally had 27 million people, as you know, who died, roughly 27 million people died in the Soviet Union in the Second World War. It's an enormous number of people. Their country was occupied by the Nazis, lots of it. Their cities were devastated. Their economy was broken. These, these people, I mean, talking to them, you felt that sense of death was, it was, it was something that happened, you know? That's what happened. And I think that attitude was, was one of the things that powered that, 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 that almost indifference to risk. Um, that secrecy, um, that we've, we've faced this incredible amount of death and hardship already is what powered Yuri Gagarin and the whole Soviet space program to do this extraordinary thing 60 years ago and fly in space. Um, I'm always intrigued, Stephen, by something we in Soviet, Sovietologists like to call Homo Sovieticus. Homo Sovieticus, if you can pick up the word, it's kind of a characteristic of yeah. how the old mannerisms of the Soviet Union survive and survive and survive. Wouldn't this obsessive secrecy be a manifestation of the persistence of that old Soviet trait? I don't think it's just Soviet. I think it's Russian to a certain extent. And I think it still exists. I mean, I, when I was researching this book, people were suspicious of me, you know? Uh, who is this Brit, you know, coming into our world and telling our story? I mean, Yuri Gagarin is a massive icon. I mean, he's hardly known now in the West. I mean, he's not hardly known, but actually of a certain generation, I think he is not very well known. In the Soviet Union and now in Russia, he is this incredible iconic figure. Mm -hmm. Yes, he I've is. I've got a picture of, 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 I'll show you this. I've got a picture of his statue. If we go to number 28, this is a statue that dominates Moscow. I mean, it is, it's higher than, for those of you who may have been to, to London, it's, it's I think the same height as Nelson's column in Trafalgar Square in London. I mean, that is a statue of Yuri Gagarin in a square called Gagarin Square in Moscow. You'd never get that in Times Square with Neil Armstrong. It's unthinkable, you know? But that is the difference between the cultures. So you get a massive, there's, a, there, you know, people, am I messing with their hero? 
That was the real question that, that people want. And I kept saying, I'm just trying to find, I'm going to try and interview the last eyewitnesses. I'm going to try and get to grips with this incredible story. I'm not messing with anything. I'm just trying to get to the truth because there's so much myth around this, both here and also in the United States to try and find out what was really happening at that time, you know? And obviously in America, it was very easy to talk to people because so much of it is open and it's you know, the documentation in the Soviet Union and Russia, as you well know, Nick, I'm sure, it's much tougher. You know, I mean, just making an application to get into a library can go on forever. And no one wants to take responsibility for anything. I mean, I was doing an interview, or filming an interview with one of the, with one of the cosmonauts. And this guy, uh, we, we had an, an air conditioning unit on and we couldn't get them to switch it off because we needed to do so to get good sound. We couldn't get them to switch it off until they had gone through a whole series of hierarchical right to the top of the museum. And then it came all the way to turn a switch and therefore switch off the air conditioning so my sound recorders could actually hear the interview properly. I mean, that is, that is the level of uh, caution again on the Soviet side um, and also of not wanting to be held responsible because responsibility means or could mean and did once mean the gulag. Well, it could mean a you know bullet in the back of the neck. That's what it could actually mean. So I mean that's part of the that's part, of, and that's why all this stuff. I and mean, we haven't really talked about the flight itself, but that is, you know, that is part of the secrecy that surrounds. I mean, Yuri Gagarin himself was not allowed to tell his family what he was doing, and the first time his own parents learned that he was actually not a serving Air Force pilot but actually he was flying in space, the first human being to do so, was when they heard it on the radio. I mean, it's the first time they knew. I mean, it is literally that, like, can you, again, can you imagine that, that, that Neil Armstrong wouldn't have told his mum and dad that he was actually flying to the moon? That's the situation that, that, that we're dealing with there, that level of, 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 of secrecy that is endemic and still survives, I think, in, in, a, in a culture that is, that is both incredibly warm-hearted when, when they trust you, but can also be outwardly very careful, cautious, and sometimes downright paranoid. Well, on the same theme, there's one anecdote in your book that uh, always makes me laugh, obviously. Uh, I'm trying to remember, remember it correctly. You have the incident, it's a for a team of six cosmonauts. They are to manufacture spacesuits and after long period of trials and so on and so forth, they come out with only three. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. I mean, that was typical. I mean, the, 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 the night before, I think two days before, I mean, let me show you a picture of the space. So get, let me get people to, because I think it's quite nice for them to see. Let, let's just go right to the, the heart of it. Let's go to number eight. I want to show you what the spacecraft is that it looked like that Yuri Gagarin went around the world in, because I think it's great for people to actually see this. Um, because otherwise you don't really get a sense of, 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 you know, in a sense how primitive this technology is. Okay. Wow. That is what Yuri Gagarin sat inside and went round the globe in 106 minutes in April 1961 in. Okay. That is called a Vostok, which means east. That is a sphere, essentially, as you can see. That's just after it landed. It, unlike the, um, the NASA spacecraft, which always land in the water, as you know, the Soviet and to this day spacecraft always land, or Russian spacecraft today, the Soyuz land back on Mother Russia. And that is what he went in. Uh, it's obviously been burned, but that's Gagarin's capsule. That's it. Um, that's the one. And in fact, if I show you another picture of it, as it is today, you see this comes back to the iconic figure. If we go to number 26, Kelly, we can go there you'll see I, I, there's a museum, which is very difficult for a Westerner to get access to, but my Russian researcher managed to get access for me to it. Although you have to go through a huge number of hoops to get into it. Oh no, that's not what I mean. Number, sorry, uh, number 26, I thought, is that number 26? In which case I probably got it wrong. Uh, that's actually Yuri Gagarin's car preserved to this day in a sealed box. Uh, it doesn't matter if we don't have it. It was actually a picture of the spacecraft with a red carpet going up to it as it is to this very day. So it doesn't really matter if we don't have it. But the key thing is, is that it's a tiny little sphere that he actually sits inside. That's what he is. And, and that same sphere 
three days before the flight, they suddenly discover is too heavy. There it is, right? I mean, I mean, look at that. I mean, the, I love the red carpet. I just think that's just wonderful. Um, and by the way, somebody just asked if the pictures in the book, many of those pictures actually are in the book. Not all of them, actually that one, I don't think is in the book, even though I took it myself, but, but many of them actually are. But I post them on my Twitter page and stuff like that. Um, that spacecraft, that tiny kind of capsule was too heavy. So what did they do three days before? Again, this is something that, that I discovered in my researches. Literally, one engineer took it upon himself to rip parts of the wiring of the inside of that spacecraft out three days before the flight, just pulled out bits of wiring um, in order to make it light enough for a human being to actually go inside because the weight was very critical. So actually did that. So, so when Sergei Korolev arrives the next morning, just before the spacecraft is going to be sent out to the launch pad, the whole assembly hall has bits of wires and bits of machinery littered across its floor. And of course he has a famous temper anyway, has a massive tantrum at that point, and they stuff bits of it back in, in order to get it to the right weight, but not too much stuff back in. Um, but they actually misconnect some of the wires. So some of the gauges in this little, this little, this little, this don't even work properly. So that again, is a sort of relative primitiveness. Um, can we just have a look at the inside of the, of the spacecraft? Because you sort of see, if we look at, um, I think it's actually quite amazing for people to see, uh, if we look at, uh, where is it? Number 14, you'll see just how primitive it is. Um, the interior of that sphere look like that. That is a spacecraft, but it looks like a very primitive car. I think there are four dials that I can see there. And then just above those four dials, there's a little like a schoolroom globe which was a sort of navigational instrument that was supposed to show the cosmonaut where he was over the earth at any one time. And in fact, it didn't work properly. Um, and at one point Gagarin triumphantly says, I'm over America, when he was actually nowhere near America at all. He was somewhere over the South Pacific. Um, and basically on the left, he's got a series of switches that, that are like being in, a, in an airplane to this day. I mean, he could make it hotter or colder. He had a tape recorder in there, but somebody had forgotten to put in enough tape and halfway around the world, the tape actually ran out. So he had to make an executive decision to rewind the tape, go back over what he just recorded. This is the first human being in space and then re-record over that. So it's been lost forever. I mean, it's, it, is, it is incredibly primitive and rather terrifying and rather incredible that a human being could do something like that. So lots of things went wrong in that flight. Um, and there was less than a 50% chance that he would come back from that flight alive. Uh, but incredibly, well, you have to read it really. I mean, it, it, was it, was, it, was, it was so narrow and so tight, the chances and margins of success. Um, and there was any, you know, number of horrible, gruesome ways in which he might have perished, but didn't. I think we've come to the point where we have just a few moments left. And I, to bring things to more of a narrative that reflects his life, we haven't touched at all on the darker side of his legacy and, and, and what became of him in, in the years after. And uh, we have the basic problems, uh, stories of alcoholism. We have him falling out of uh, the second story of an upscale hotel in Crimea. Um, and with a mistress. Ba badly, pardon? Probably with a mistress. Probably, I was gonna, I'm he glad you put chased, that in. He was actually chased out. He was, he was almost certainly in bed with, a, well, we don't know who it was, but with somebody and his wife uh, discovered what was going on. And uh, he was so panic stricken that he actually leapt off the balcony uh, this is in a Black Sea resort, kind of an elite Black Sea resort, and crashed to the floor um, and was so badly injured that he had to have an operation for his above his eye, piece of plastic surgery. Um, and the story that was released by the Soviets was that he had actually, his, he had fallen trying to rescue his daughter 
who had actually fallen, his little infant daughter, and he'd saved his daughter with his face. And in fact, he was actually running away from his wife. That's actually what happened. Uh, he hit the, hit the pavement like that. And you can see that uh, all the pictures are after that, he's got a slightly weird eyebrow. I mean, you can see it in one of my pictures in the book. Where do you, and that's where the surgeons had actually tried to kind of mend that. But, you know, for his wife, every time he looked, she looked at his face, she was looking at infidelity. It was right there in the eyebrow. He was, he suffered from, from like all, like, like, you know, like some of the Apollo astronauts. I mean, it, the, the pressure, he, the, he was the most famous man on the planet when that happened, after that flight. He really was. He was the rock star of rock stars. And um, famously, he came to the UK amongst hundreds of countries around the world and, and took tea with the Queen, a very successful tea, apparently, with the Queen. And he was mobbed here, but not in the United States. He went once to address the United Nations, but he was never on tour in the United States. Isn't it funny how those, those mm. old oppositions were, you know, they were still, they were, I mean, it was very humiliating for America. And a reason, because it was so humiliating, it is why Kennedy starts the new space race to get a human being on the moon. And one final point um, on the whole question of his death, um, which was in a plane crash. Do you, do you give any credibility to the rumors that there might be <coughs> other circumstances that? You mean, was he murdered by the KGB? Yes. I mean, there, there, are, there are, I mean, like, uh, you know, Kennedy's assassination, like Princess Diana's awful death, um, Gagarin's death has also occasioned a million conspiracies. Um, he died in a plane crash, so people understand. He died in 1968. He was he was he'd, he'd been off flying for a long time. He was no longer allowed to go into space. He was too precious. Uh, he was retraining in jet planes, and he was with an instructor one day in 1968, an experienced instructor, when something happened to the plane, and he crashed into the forest, and he I mean he was incinerated basically, as was his instructor. And ever since that time, there were three investigations, one of them by the KGB, all of them top secret. Files were not released for decades. Some of them have not been released to this day. And of course, when you have a culture of secrecy, you then get a culture of conspiracy. It's inevitable. One follows from the other. And that's what happened in this instance. So there's a million things, a million stories. I actually asked members of his family directly. I asked his daughter, who's a very, very major figure today in Russia. She runs the, the, the Kremlin Museum. I mean, it's a major deal uh, in Red Square. And she is somebody I got to know very well. She was fantastically helpful with the book. But I asked her directly, do you think your father was murdered by the KGB? And she said, nobody really knows what happened. I don't think so, but nobody knows. Um, his father, Alexei, apparently went to his grave believing his father would be murdered. Well, why would they murder Yuri Gagarin? Well, one, I don't believe this is true. I don't think they did murder him, by the way. I think it was actually a horrible accident. It was such a mess. It's like so often happens in, in Russia and in the Soviet Union. What happens is it's actually not a big conspiracy. It's just chaos that then gets sort of muddled up and that's what happens um, and turned into something else. But it is certainly true that um, some of the evidence was tampered with. Um, and I did interview the first man to walk in space, a famous cosmonaut, Russian cosmonaut called Alexei Leonov, who's now dead. I interviewed him in Cologne. And on the record, he told me that he managed to, he was one of Gagarin's best friends. He was there on the day of the crash. And 20 years later, he managed to get the files released, which contained his testimony about what happened. And they've been completely altered even though his signature was there. They've been changed. Somebody had altered his testimony. Who knows what happened? Gagarin had become increasingly angry about the direction that the Soviet space program was taking afterwards, after his flight. Korolev died in that botched operation that I told you about earlier on in this, in this discussion. Um, and Khrushchev was replaced by his successor, Brezhnev. And Brezhnev did not like Gagarin. He was not, you know, Gagarin was Khrushchev's man. So he's out of favor. And this Americans by that point were really getting ahead with the, the moon program. They were doing very well. 
and the, the Soviets were falling apart. And Brezhnev kept saying, we want more, we want more, we want more. And they put up a spacecraft, which we know as the Soyuz, and is now a very reliable spacecraft. And they put this spacecraft up and they put on board Gagarin's best friend, a man called Komarov. And they put the spacecraft up, even though it had hundreds of flaws on it, just to get ahead with the Americans. And everything went wrong with that spacecraft. And Komarov knew he was a doomed man. And as he came back to Earth, the parachute system failed to open and he crashed into the ground and made a massive crater and died. And Gagarin, so his daughter said, I interviewed her. It's the only time she saw her father cry. And he was furious. He was so angry. She said he was, he was, this was his best friend. And he went all the way to the top to say, what are we doing? What is going on? This is the great icon, okay? A year later, he was dead in a plane crash. Um, so what happened? As I said, some people think he was murdered. I don't think that. I actually think it was a, it was a colossal, chaotic accident. Um, and I say so in the book. But, you know, the fact is there's no answer. We, we don't know to this day. But it, just, it, was, it, was, it was a huge, huge moment in history when, when this, this legend, this iconic figure, finally, finally passed away in uh, 1968 in such mysterious circumstances. Well, thank you very much, Steve. I think, I think we've thank come you. towards the end of our hour. Um, you've written a great book. You're a great conversationalist. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much. And I have to say, I'm very pleased in one level because I, it's wonderful talking to you. And I've really enjoyed it. But the really good thing as well is I'm very glad we haven't talked so much about the actual flight itself because, because I think that, I hope that people will be drawn to, to, to read the book because I think, I mean, that's obviously a very key part of it. And I think that, um, well, there's lots of secrets that are going to be revealed and lots of bits of drama that you're, and it's good that we've kind of not done too much on that because I don't want to give too much away anyway. So um, thank you. And I've enjoyed it enormously. It's been great talking to you, all of you. Thank you. Thanks, it, is, it is such an honor to have both of you on this program. And Stephen, you weave a story with such passion and excitement and intrigue. And I think everyone in our audience should know that that is how the book reads as well. And um, it's just such an honor to be able to share your work with our audience as well. Thank you for being with us. I'm wondering, just before we go, Kelly, can you share the image of, of the painting of Yuri Gagarin um, here in the museum? Do you have that with you? Well, we I'm... actually have a painting on view. Here it is. Look oh at my that. God. Now, actually, that's a fascinating picture. Isn't because, it? Well, if we, I mean, what I'd love to see is his feet. <laughs> and the reason I say that, and I know you're not expecting me to say that, Gagarin, okay, is this is at Vnukov, Vnukov I can't remember how it's at the airport in Moscow. Mm -hmm. um, and this is two days after the flight. It's April the 14th, 1961. And he walks up this long red carpet to be greeted by Khrushchev, who's holding a hat there. And also his family, who are like one minute they're farmers, his father was a carpenter, and the next minute they're hobnobbing with the greatest in the land. Khrushchev famously gives him a bear hug a few moments after that. But also Gagarin, as he walked up that red carpet, Gagarin's shoelace came undone. And you can see it in the film. It's flapping against his foot. I mean, he's got the whole world, the live TV. It's going across the, much of the world, certainly across Europe and the whole of the Soviet Union as well, live. The BBC are there, everything. And his shoelace is undone and it keeps getting more undone. It, it literally bangs against his foot as he walks. And when they actually put together the footage of this moment afterwards, the question was, should they leave this in or not? And Gagarin insisted on leaving the shoelace in because he said it made me as I am a human being and not an icon. So the interesting question is, have they taken the shoelace? Is it tied up? in that picture or is it actually coming undone? Which is I am going to go down to the gallery and find <laughs> out and let you know, Stephen. That is fascinating. Is this the myth version or is this the real version? That's the kind of thing my book is all about, you know? You get these I love it. which are crazy, you know. This is wonderful. Well, as I've posted the um, 
information in the chat box, you are uh, certainly welcome to purchase Beyond by Stephen Walker via our museum shop. Um, also, I've linked to his uh, Twitter handle. You should definitely follow him on Twitter. He's a very fascinating person in general. So, um, and, and his website as well, where you can uh, even learn more about the intrigue of this amazing feat of Yuri Gagarin. Again, it's been a pleasure and I hope that we stay in touch and maybe someday you'll be able to come see that painting, Stephen. I'm desperate to come now, I have to come. You must email me and tell me. I will. <laughs> you're, gonna, you're gonna get an email with the shoes, just the shoes. Okay, that sounds wonderful. <laughs> and thank you so much indeed. And also thank you, Nick, for, for asking such um, wise and penetrating and wonderful questions to, to get something out thank of you. Appreciate it. Absolutely, what a pleasure. Thanks Kelly for doing all the work with the photos as well. Uh, we will be posting this program on our YouTube channel and on our website, and I'm sure Stephen will be posting it on his website as well. He has given quite a few um, fascinating interviews, so if you want to learn even more about the book, um, there, are, there are quite a few interviews about it on his website. So with that, thank you everyone, and we look forward to seeing you all again soon. Until then, be safe, be happy, and be well. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.